welcome. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see such a, a large group of this, uh, what I hope will be an important session. I think, as we all know, risk assessment instruments are appearing and in, in, in growing in widespread use in all sorts of domains in our society. human services delivery, and also, as we all know, in the criminal justice system. Um, and that is going to be our focus today of this uh, panel discussion. And uh, I feel really grateful uh, for the group of people who agreed uh, to participate um, in this moderated discussion. Uh, this discussion will be moderated by Jens Ludwig, uh, who is Edwin A. and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor uh, at the Harris School here at the University of Chicago. Um, I think I suspect that pretty much everybody uh, is familiar with his work as director of the Crime Lab, for which he deserves, I mean, enormous credit uh, for assembling uh, that group and all that they've done. And he's also uh, co-director of the Education Lab. Um, also participating uh, is Raid Ghani. Uh, uh, Barid is also is somebody we actually poached from the University of Chicago. Uh, he's now at, uh, at, at my home university, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where he's the distinguished career professor in uh, Carnegie Mellon's Department of uh, Machine Learning, which is located in our Compu Computer Science College. And he's also a member of my home fa faculty college, the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public uh, Policy. Uh, Reed was also the former chief scientist in the, uh, uh, in the Obama, admission, Obama administration's, uh, uh, President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. Uh, uh, Tracy Mears um, is also joining us. Uh, she's the Walton Hale Professor of Law at the Yale, at the Yale Law School and co-founding director of the school's uh, Justice Collaboratory. And then finally, um, we have Rob Sampson uh, joining us, who's the Henry Ford II Professor of Social Sciences at Harvard, uh, and he's director of the, uh, the <coughs> Social Science Program at the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study. Um, and, um, and as I think many of us know, uh, Rob is, was an, is an instrumental figure in the project on human, human development in uh, Chicago neighborhoods. So I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Jens. Again, thank you all for agreeing to this. Experience. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Dan, for organizing this. On behalf of all of us who live in Chicago, welcome uh, to my home city. Um, we're in the middle of a heat wave, so I hope you're all appreciating and enjoying that. Um, the structure of today's uh, panel, we're not going to have prepared presentations. We're going to have a moderated conversation among the panel for the first part, and we're um, hoping to make this as interactive as possible and have lots of questions uh, and dialogue with those of you who've come out. So thanks also for coming out uh, in such great numbers as well. I think as most of the people who are here today know, um, risk assessment in criminology dates back at least to the 1920s. And I think it's fair to say that it was controversial from the very beginning. Uh, lots of questions about whether prediction in crime settings is possible. And over the last 100 years, there's been a lot of concern and increasing concern about uh, how risk assessment contributes to fairness and things like bias in the criminal justice system as well. And so. I can't imagine a better panel to um, help us think through the possibilities and the pitfalls of these, uh, of these tools. Um, let me start off with a question that's primarily directed at Raid, but I hope that all of the other panelists will feel free to jump in uh, with any of these questions. Let me start with a question for Raid. Over the past 20 or 30 years, there's been growing availability of uh, administrative criminal justice data, part of the larger big data movement. And there's been the development alongside of that, I think not coincidentally, of a lot of new statistical tools from artificial intelligence called machine learning or whatever you would want to call it. I think everybody in the room is at least familiar with that terminology, if not uh, uh, familiar in depth with the specifics of the methods. I wondered if you could kick us off by saying a little bit about how those developments change the prediction landscape, starting with, but not limited to the question of whether prediction is even possible. Uh, sure. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm not going to defend the field. Um, yes, I, <laughs> I, I am part of that field, but, but 
but I, I don't take responsibility for, for everything there. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, at least the way I think about a lot of developments in statistical, you know, pick your favorite buzzword of today, right? AI, machine learning, data science, big data, pick, pick. There, there are certain developments that have, um, that are more mature, right? So the things that have worked really well in those cases are, are things where you're sort of classifying objects. Um, so looking at images and seeing, you know, is this a cat or a dog, right? Very important critical societal problem right now. Um, or trying to figure out if, you know, some uh, uh, video is, is about, um, you know, um, what topic or kind of not prediction tasks, but, but separating things. Um, and even then, you've noticed a lot of sort of probably heard about issues there in, in, in face recognition, for example. So I think those are some of the things where it's a little bit more mature. And then there are things, and the goal in those tasks is humans are, are reasonably good at those tasks, but are not as fast as, as machines can be. So the goal is not necessarily improve over humans, but, but be more efficient. Uh, whereas the type of things we're talking about here, prediction tasks, risk assessment, humans aren't that great. They don't, they've, they've, and that's why they're using these instruments, uh, whether computer-based, data-based, or more intuition and gut-based. And, and the goal here is not to be faster, because it's not as if you know um, humans are great, but they're just really slow. They take years to figure out one person's future. It, it was not the time. If it took six months for us to do risk assessment and it was more accurate, in many cases, that would be fine. Uh, so I think where we are with, with the intersection of machine learning advances and a lot of more data and, and risk assessment is that a lot of those advances haven't been designed for those specific types of tasks like risk prediction uh, or risk assessment. They're kind of general purpose abstract toolkits that have been developed, um, which means they, 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 don't, they don't quite work for, for, for these types of, of, of tasks, right? So for example, they all rely on having accurate outcome data. So if you know exactly if everybody who was arrested should have been arrested and everybody who wasn't arrested shouldn't, um, wasn't arrested, like, if that was true, then, and you gave these systems this, you know, it will be able to somewhat accurately figure out patterns. But we know that's not true. So same for, we often give the administrative data that's been coming out has been, you know, it's not, it's not comprehensive. It's again, very siloed. So we might get data from the criminal justice system, but not about the context of the criminal justice system and not about the healthcare needs this person might have or the educational opportunity, the employment opportunities where so, so we kind of give it very limited, you know, we sort of blindfold the, the, the machine and, and hope that it, it figures out all the other things. Um, and there are a lot of sort of similar issues that, 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 that come up. And I think the, the, the bottom line really is that, you know, what we think of as, when people who are developing these methods are thinking of as generic prediction methods, you know, there is no such thing as a generic risk assessment. It depends on what you want to use it for. Um, and, and I think because there is this, a gap between the fields, you know, the, the people developing those methods are not talking to, working with, collaborating with generally. There are exceptions, you know, some of people here. That leads to sort of this, take this box, apply it here, assume it's good, and, and move on to the next problem. Um, and so I think it's not a very mature area. It's not very well understood. It doesn't work as far as we know today. Uh, so lots of problems. Hopefully people can, can start fixing. Jens, could I just yeah, yeah, please. Really I was going to ask on, you on that, which is um, not to say a lot because I have other things that I, I want to say, but I do think an interesting follow up to what Raid was just mentioning, which is to say, he says you want to ask what it is you're using it for, and often people will talk about prediction of a person's involvement in crime. Just that statement should indicate all of the problems that we're talking about. What does it even mean to say that? Um, first of all, it's an undifferentiated category, number one. And number two, um, especially in the moment in which we're living in, people have serious questions in how we classify certain behaviors as falling into that very generalized category in, in the first place, um, which gets us to what is, what is the meaning of the exercise mm -hmm. at all. I thought it's worth mentioning that piece of it. And let me just add, add something to, uh, to try and underscore what both Tracy and Rayid just said, which is 
if you if you think about so we're we're all looking out in the world reading the same news accounts and uh, and academic studies about AI failures alongside periodic AI successes as well. And I, I just wanted to underscore a point that both Tracy and Raid are making, which is when we see AI failures in the criminal justice system, it is almost never the case that the problem is with the machine learning engineering. That is, it is not the case that some computer scientist wrote the R code incorrectly. And I think the way to understand, so I'm just emphasizing a point that both Tracy and Reed are making and saying in a slightly different way, which is, you know, I'm, I was trained as a garden variety economist, and so I, didn't, I couldn't even spell AI until five years ago. So I started to audit a bunch of computer science classes at the University of Chicago. And what's Sorry. remarkable, yeah, I, um, <laughs> I was about to make a joke about the quality of computer science instruction. Um, but what's striking about computer science coursework is you know the starting point for cs instruction is assume a data set with a y variable and a bunch of x's and so i think the point that both raid and tracy are making is that the failures come from not thinking deeply enough about what y variable you have and what x's you have for a given application and that has to solving those failures has to be people of the sort that are in this room we can't leave that just to the computer scientists. And, and I think, I mean, to your point, I think there is a huge, you know, it's much worse than what you're describing, right? Because there is absolutely no thought about what should this system do? Like you would think the first thing you would do is sit down and figure out what should this thing do? There is, there is a thought. So, so the people who are designing the system are not really designing it. They're, they're just running some code and they're hoping that the AI system does magically what the world intends it to do when nobody's ever talked to people about what it should do. And so I think that's going to be, to Yen's point, when you see kind of failures, the failures of kind of people designing those systems who, who, who don't quite, haven't figured out what it should be doing, and they're building these things without that, that, that context in mind. Yeah. Did you want to add something, Rob? Or? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a good way to start the conversation, essentially saying, you know, humans are centrally involved here. But Jens, I just want to emphasize another point that you started out with, and that's the history, because I, I worry a little bit that sort of the blame might be focused too much on a particular statistical algorithm, right? Because prediction is an old, uh, old topic in criminology, and you can even think of very simple methods of prediction. And actually, you know, an OLS regress regression is, that is a prediction in a way. Um, you can think about how you're predicting the particular um, you know, coefficients. You don't even need to go down the road of a fancy uh, machine learning algorithm. And in fact, if you think about something like, let's take Comstat in New York, where you just look at where crimes are occurring, you put it up on a map. And in a sense, that is prediction, in the sense that officers or, or commanders were being told to, quote, reduce crime. Why? Well, obviously, because it's in that particular area, so there's a prediction that's where it's going to happen in the future. And so that, I think, just surfaces even more the notion of you have to think about what's going to happen ex ante. There, I mean, there's, and I think it's an, an important point that e even something like a map with crimes, and you think about the policies that you're going to implement, let's say aggressive policing or whatever it would be in those particular areas, the human decisions involve not just whether or not it's accurate, but you need to, it seems to me anyway, reflect because you have information ex ante on where those patrol patterns will take place and which communities are gonna be affected. So it's no surprise. It was known in advance what communities would be disproportionately uh, police. Now, you could argue that given crime reductions, if in fact there's a causal effect, that that might be of greater value and the community might actually value that, but they may not. Those are the sorts of questions I think you need to ask and I think is what we're getting at in a way that these sorts of human evaluations are independent of any particular algorithm, even if it's exact. Yeah. Uh, so I worry less about the prediction accuracy than the, the actual... Um, 
implementation in the, in the interpretations that are given to it. Wait, let, let me just add one, one coda to this, and then I've got a, a question back to you, Rob, which is, um, you know, there are many applications for which accuracy is hugely important. For instance, um, for predicting risk to inform pretrial detention or release decisions. Um, the, the, the one thing that I wanted to uh, add on to what Rob said, because he, as he mentioned, these new AI or machine learning tools are in the same family uh, at a general level as regression of the sort that everybody in this room uh, knows how to do. The only other thing that I wanted to, mm -hmm. I wanted to add to that is um, if you look at sort of the, the statistical properties of these new AI tools, so Rick, you should correct me if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm mischaracterizing any of this, the advantage of AI, AI tools over regular statistical regression, those advantages are proportional typically to the length and width of our data set. And you know, with this sort of social science data sets that we're used to working with, sometimes the advantages of AI can be modest. But as we have this growing availability of administrative data in the criminal justice system and all sorts of applications, I think the, to the extent to which we do care about predictive accuracy, the advantages of AI will only, for prediction are only going to be growing over, over time. And in my experience, the advantages particularly show up in being able to predict accurately at the tails of the risk distribution, which often are particularly important from a policy perspective. And so you're right that this is connected to the past, but it's not exactly the same that we have Correct. in the past. Okay. Can, I, so, can I add one more oh, thing yeah, to that? So I think, I think that's an important point is the advances you've seen, you know, so when you see headlines about AI, they're all sorts of like games that people play, right? Chess and Go and those type of things. The reason they work so well is because they can automate data generation. They play against each other, and that generates new data to, 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 to train the algorithms. Um, and the other areas works really well, get images and things like that, is again, people sort of can, there are millions and millions and millions of those things out there, um, and they're all kind of similar. And so you can ignore some of the, the contextual things there, uh, whereas in a lot of these type of things, we don't have you know, millions and millions and millions happening every single day. Uh, and I think that scale, we're not there yet, but we do have the width that traditional methods couldn't use. Right. When, when we get to connecting data across different sources um, and seeing a lot more information, in the old days, we would sort of have to figure out what are the six most important variables? And that's where we'd use our intuition and gut. But now we don't have to make that choice, but we're still not there where we can use the size to really do a better job. We're, we're kind of in that middle ground of we're still using some of the simpler techniques in risk assessment because the more complex and modern ones aren't we don't have the right data for it yet. Yeah, and just a translation question and then leading to a question to Rob. When, when we say wide data sets, we're talking about <laughs> the number of columns or variables in a data set and the length, we mean the number of rows or, or observations. So one of the things that I wanted to, to ask Rob about now, which is, if you, which is related to thinking about what the variables in our, our, data, our prediction models um, are, going back to the 1920s when criminologists criminologists started to think about prediction, most of the variables that criminologists have been working with historically are features of the individual. Um, as, if, as if risk for crime involvement or whatever the outcome that you're predicting would be um, is inherent and lies only in the individual. And as Rob, as you and many others have, have uh, taught us over the years, it's not clear that that's necessarily the right way to think about the determinants of crime. How do you, how does your thinking about the role of, that context plays in shaping criminal behavior change how you think about or change how the field should think about risk prediction? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, several dimensions to that. So um, one, I guess I would just start by saying that to the extent that contextual features, and I'll use that generally, are important in terms of crime, criminal involvement, or the you know, official policing, they're not necessarily the same thing, then that does change the way conceptually that we should think about what it means, for example, to have a criminal record baked into a criminal record, if that's one of the factors that goes into a prediction to the extent that prior contextual features influence that, then of course, that means we need to think about it differently. It's, quote, biased in a certain sense. To the extent that social features, the environment, 
I mean, factors, for example, that I've studied over the years, if you think about it at the more community level in terms of factors like concentration of poverty, racial segregation, to the extent that that socially organizes urban space in ways that affects both the, deli you know, the delivery of criminal justice, but also uh, involvement in criminality itself, then that in itself changes, it seems to me, the way that we should think about prediction. Now, is that bias or accuracy? Um, yeah, well, it, it depends. I mean, it's biased in the sense that, again, something like race, and we know that there's racial bias in, in terms of some of these algorithms, not so much in, in the statistical sense, right? That's, it, it's not statistically biased, but in terms of what, what it means to say that people from certain groups um, have a higher, let's say, estimated proclivity or propensity to reoffend in the future. And that's what I guess I was getting at going back. We don't even need a fancy algorithm to run into that problem. But I think it's actually a deeper uh, problem. So let me talk about another kind of context that I think has not been sufficiently conceptualized or analyzed, and that's what I'll call cohort bias that stems from even beyond contextual features like the social class of an individual, race, neighborhood, and that has to do with uh, societal change. And if I just uh, for a moment talk about a little bit of research that's based on work with Roland Neal, Dan Nagin, and, and some others, that has looked at how different cohorts are coming of age in different historical times. And what we've shown, a particularly recent paper in the AJS, in, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, is that aging through particular contexts, independent of one's propensity to criminality, based on classic criminological characteristics that we can measure well, independent even of neighborhood characteristics, individual characteristics, the probability of, for example, being arrested is deeply affected by those macro social changes on the order of 100% or more. And it's not just that that shifts individuals' probability of being arrested, but it also interacts with some of our classic predictors like poverty. If you were disadvantaged, it actually matters a lot what time and what age period you were, um, you, were, you, were, you were coming of age. So for example, kids that were coming of age in the, right here in Chicago, adolescents in the early to mid 90s, disadvantaged kids had much higher probabilities of being arrested than advantaged um, kids, whereas that gap narrowed over time such that the differential in by about 2005 for the same age kids of different cohorts narrowed considerably. So what does this mean for prediction, getting back to our panel? Whether you do straight, quote, simple methods of prediction or, and work with um, some colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, but Dan, we've done machine learning, calibrated it on the older cohorts, younger cohorts, no matter what way you cut the data, there is substantial over uh, prediction and it matters, again, which characteristics you have. So it's not just, again, a, a, an absolute social change, but things like self-control or poverty, those predictions are gonna change. So to me, and I think what we're arguing is that that shifts our thinking about, about prediction, that, it, that if you use the instrument, and let's say it's calibrated, just for the sake of argument, perfectly, it works, Fine, but if it's, quote, trained, to use the lingo of um, your world, um, <laughs> on information from the past, yeah, it's like going to be wrong, <laughs> right, in terms of the future. Now, that might seem obvious in retrospect, but in fact, in practice, in the criminal justice system, that's what we do, mm -hmm. okay? We're always going forward based on the past, but to the extent that the world changes, that means that it's inaccurate. So to me, again, that's what I was trying to say earlier, it's, it's less about the statistical properties of an algorithm, and I, and I think the machine learning has some precision characteristics that are valuable, and we can see that in, even in our data. But I think the problem 
is deeper. So, I mean, we can talk later about like what are the pragmatic implications. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to throw up our hands, but to me, it seems that there are implications for both um, thinking about the meaning of, of those records in terms of, you know, we can talk about sort of adversity mitigation, if you will. Um, but I think the, the other implication is that we need to continually fine tune in real time those um, predictions. I can say more about that later, but it's a characteristic of the instruments that goes beyond the data themselves. It's, it's about the social context of change, even with perfect measurement. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting, so a lot of fields have started using machine learning over the last, you know, say 10 years. And, and, and I think they've all sort of figured out some of these things, right? So, so the risk of somebody doing something isn't about them, in many cases, it's not about them at all, unfortunately. Yeah. It's about the rest of society uh, and how they're going to, I mean, even just take risk of arrest. Does it depend more on the person or on the policing practices in place? Right? You change the policing practices and you can keep, so think of this data point. If this data point is the same over the years, the risk of this person just by themselves is going to change widely depending on where they are, to Rob's point. Uh, but, but I think we know that intuitively, but we don't then enter that information into the machine learning system, yes. um, and and we don't know why, and and we do that in a lot of areas, right? So, like uh, in in every single project we do, there is the context of what's been happening in the world. Um, what are the arrest rates in that area? How have they changed over time? What types of people? People like this person. Um, what has been happening to those people in this in this again? The challenge is when we sort of make these hand wavy people similar in the recent past in this neighborhood. Well, we don't, what does that mean within a mile, within a block, within the last week, within the last year, people with the same race or age or gender or background or cohort, you know, those are very vague things. And, and this is actually one place where I'd encourage everyone to kind of think about, that's where machine learning helps, is you can throw all of them in with different values. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism of machine learning not being able to do, you know, not useful for causal inference. And that's generally, you know, it's not necessarily exactly true, but one thing we use a lot of machine learning for is to test out these theories, right? So if it's not predictive, it's not going to be causal. Um, but just because it's, it's predictive, it's, you know, it doesn't make it causal. But at least you can test these theories and say, I'm going to put in all these different contexts, and I'm going to vary what's happening within this di different distances and different time periods and different definitions of similar. And then see what things are predictive of what types of behaviors, of what types of people over what period of time, and then you keep redoing it, right? So instead of building a risk model, you build a risk model up to 2012 based on data up to then. Then you test it on the next year, and then you build one for 13, 14, and 15, and 16. So you can actually simulate how robust it would have been if you had built it 10 years ago. And if it wasn't going to be robust and it would have been overpredicted in the next couple of years, we can test that and then implement that exactly that way so it gets updated. You know, our other risk instruments don't get updated very often. You know, you build it once and then it's, there's an RCT and then, you know, even take the, the Arnold uh, PSA tool, right? It was a one-off RCT. It wasn't that every, every day we're updating it and then testing it over and over again, which is kind of what we need to get to. It has to be a continuous ongoing test because these systems change every day when you update them. And I have to go on and uh, jump in on this, which is to say, that once you hear the complexity of this, I do want to reemphasize the point that Rob just made. And it's not about throwing up our hands, but I do think what it is about is um, an assertion that we need to be incredibly humble about what we're doing here. Um, because once you understand that we're talking about certain kinds of conceptual frameworks, then it's not just about how good someone is at programming, it's not really necessarily just about what are the uh, pragmatic implications. There are deep questions here. There are philosophical questions here that people need to be um, attending to. What is the meaning of the exercise in which you're engaged in? And the meaning of the exercise can't simply be, well, we're just trying to make predictions about a person's involvement in crime. That's almost an incoherent question. When we're talking about data science and so on, 
you know, people are really committed to ideas about evidence-based policy making and the, the ways in which that is quote unquote less partisan and 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 so on. And you know, I think it's useful to remember always that you know, what lawyers would say, um, evidence is a set of facts that you offer in answer to a question. But you have to be clear about what that question is, and theory helps you to, ans to ask a question to which this data can supply an answer. Just, just to add one, one thing to build on what, um, what everyone else on the panel has said, a, a practical point, but really a, a deep practical uh, concern for the use of these tools. So what you hear Rob and Raid saying is uh, it's incredibly important to the extent to which we're going to use these predictive tools, it's incredibly important to refresh them, essentially, to, to build them over and over again so the data that they're built with is as current as possible to the time period that we're using them in. And I, one of the, the, I think the, the things that we need, one of the things that we need to be humble with is here, is to recognize the limitation, the, the difficult limitations of the public sector itself especially around procuring technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, a few years ago, so sometime around 2018 or 2019, my research center got invited to help update a pretrial risk tool by an uh, anonymous US city of 8.7 million people. <laughs> and the, the tool that we were updating had last been updated in 2003. So if you think about and I would say from my experience, this anonymous city of 8.7 million people is among the best run cities in the United States. That's not to say it's a perfectly run city, but relatively speaking, this is among the best run cities in the country. And they were using a risk tool that was 16 years out of date against a backdrop, as Rob points out, where there have been massive changes in crime involvement. And that's what a well-functioning city is doing. Um, you know, there are federal government agencies now that are famously running mainframe systems from the 1950s and 1960s still because government has such a difficult time pr procuring technology. And so I think that is, you know, that's normally the sort of thing that is so mind-numbingly boring that you would, that would fall below the level of, of anyone's attention, especially if you're a social scientist trying to think about big policy questions. But Given the importance of what Rob and, and Raid are saying, I think that when we're being humble, I think we need to really realize if we're going to be doing this enterprise, we have to own that problem as well. Yeah, this, I, think, oh. I just wanted to know whether the anonymous city is it was it oversight, lack of resources, or sort of hubris about the fact that they thought it was right. Yeah, I think, here's my guess, right? Here, here's my guess, which is, I think, I think that these tools are new enough where our systems don't have intuition or understanding of how to think about them, right? right? If, here's one way to think about it. This is a city that's used to procuring lots of stuff. They have desks from 2003. They're still working fine. They have phones from 2003. They're still working fine. They have lights from 2003, they're still working fine. This is just one more boring technology thing that some, somebody in the basement procured. And so I think we collectively have not fully realized yet, this is not exactly yet another or just another technology tool that we can procure every 20 years and not think about. Yeah. It's in a fundamentally different climate. Even when you do procure it, even if you do, you don't know what to ask for. You give extremely vague requirements. Um, and so both of us have been involved in sort of these on the other side of the early intervention systems for policing, right, where, where you're trying to detect police officers who are going to do horrible things. If you actually look at requirements, RFPs that come out from, from, from departments and cities, they talk about metrics like uptime and how often can you log into the system and sort of like all those useless things that, no, that yes, you care about them, but they're not your primary metrics. So they don't not only do they not sort of procure them often enough, but also it's like they don't know what to ask for. And when they get garbage back, then they're surprised that it doesn't work. But will you ever ask for these things? Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a great point that leads to a question that I want to ask. I mean, in some sense, what you can hear Raid saying is we need a bunch of buyer's guides mm -hmm. for AI tools for, 
for the public sector. And that leads me to a question for Tracy, which is, you know, we had talked before about the problems that arise with these tools from data science people not talking to <coughs> criminologists. There's another important stakeholder community here, which is the community. And how do you or how should we as a field think about the role of the community, the role that the community should play in developing these tools, identifying what applications we should or shouldn't use these tools for, how we implement them in practice and, and right. So I think there's two ways of thinking about that. And it was, I think it's interesting that what you said is what role the community should play. Um, I have some thoughts about that. But there's a separate question, which is what can they, what role can they play in light of all of the issues um, that we've just brought up? So I think a useful place to start is to kind of recap some of the issues that we've already talked about, which is to say, you know, the task that many of these tools are being used for is to operate um, in the context of criminal legal system decisions, which many people understand and experience to have disproportionate impacts um, among certain communities, both demographically um, and geographically, and usually in some conjunction of those two things. And that's related to a point that I had made earlier about this undifferentiated category of crime. You know, so many of us work with data sets where you know, we can say that the crime categories are relatively clear to, in, the, in the sense that they are behaviors of obvious concern to anyone, um, even if they were not clearly legally prohibited, homicide, robbery, and so on. But a lot of these um, algorithms are using behaviors that um, would fall into much more contested categories because um, they are reliant upon behaviors of individuals, as Rob just mentioned, of arrest, right? And so if you're using someone's arrest record undifferentiated and you don't pay a lot of attention to particular kinds of the behaviors um, that folks are being arrested for, it can get really complicated, especially when those legal categories of prohibition are actually related to the construction of the very spaces that we worry about, right? And there's a, a reason why, um, for example, in certain spaces, behaviors like, let's say, selling loose cigarettes on a street corner are even prohibited in the first place, right? So um, that, dynamic leads to the kind of community concern, which leads then to the question of how one ought to think about their involvement in the development of these tools. And the first point I think is to be very clear um, about you know, the conceptual issues at play. And then when one is having conversations with the impacted communities, and by impacted I mean impacted by the problem that um, the state purports to use certain <laughs> mechanisms, uh, you know, responding to that problem. That is, people are experiencing, let's say, violence, and then the state responds in a certain way for which the algorithms might be useful, but those responses themselves might have particular costs on that same community. Obviously, one should, in a as a matter of good governance, um, it, it talk to, interact with, the people who are those stakeholders. So how should you do that? Well, one of the things that you know my work has shown, the work primarily that I've done primarily with Tom Tyler on the social psychology of procedural justice is that the people who are impacted in those ways tend to care much more about how they are treated in the process of developing these tools or priorities and so on than they care about the actual accuracy, we'll say. Uh, uh, of these tools and so on. Um, you know, I, I won't re rehearse the, the fine points of, of procedural justice, but it's mostly about some sense of fair treatment um, and, and fair decision making, <laughs> placing great emphasis on precisely the question that Jens asked me. Well, you know, how should we do that? I'm not filibustering, promise. Um, it, 
I, I do think that one issue that's very difficult, and, and you know, I've done this in the collaboratory and another context in our, our social media governance initiative, is that one easy answer is to say, well, you should be transparent. And what does it mean to be, say that you're being transparent about an algorithm when most people are incredibly allergic to math? Like, you, you, you can't do that, really. Like, oh, here's the algorithm. <laughs> We're transparent. That doesn't make sense, especially um, when a lot of these machine learning tools are quite complex and, you know, the algorithm itself is, is a process. There are scholars at um, Duke who are doing a lot of work on the legibility um, of these algorithms, trying to come up with ways to um, explain to people at least how they work, even if they're not actually giving folks the actual algorithms. But I guess the last thing to say is I think it's much less important for the community to be involved in the development of the tool itself or to even necessarily understand how it works. What is incredibly important is for relevant communities to be involved in the setting of goals, um, and the setting of frameworks, the priority sets about um, whether these kinds of predictive tools or prediction in any case um, is necessary, always understanding that the alternative is usually some person um, who's doing this work, right? I do a lot of work with prosecutors, judges, and so on, and, and people talk about people um, as separate from the work of algorithms. And the reality is we all have algorithms in our head, right? It's not like we're ever in a, in a prediction free zone. You know, the question is who or what is going to be the entity in, involved in, in doing that, right? So I would go back to the, the, the issues that we um, highlighted at the front end. And that really is the kind of conversation um, that we should be having, I think with impacted communities along with, um, you know, the goals. What is this for? Um, and, and also being, again, humble about whether or not this should even be happening. Last thing I'll say about pretrial detention um, commercial, um, I am going to be on a panel at 2 o'clock um, in which I am going to be talking about a paper that I wrote with Arthur Reiser called The Radical Notion of the Presumption of Innocence in Pretrial Detention. We think it shouldn't exist, um, that people should not be detained pretrial for reasons I, I can explain at that panel. But if that's right, and if that's the conversation that you're having with folks in impacted communities, then you know the relevance of what work the algorithm is doing is um, clear. It's not. <laughs> right, and yeah. you wanna yeah. so, so I love the community <laughs> focus. Uh, I guess two, two thoughts. Um, one is there's a lot of discussion these days, in particular, uh, about you know what what the community wants, and sort of going directly to what you're saying, particularly disadvantaged communities and communities that have borne the brunt of criminal justice responses. And I think that's right, but we we don't know how to, or we haven't done it well. It seems yeah. to me it's a, it's a it's a phrase. Um, and oftentimes it's whoever speaks the loudest or whatever community organization haps, happens to have the most funding in a community. To me, it seems like one solution, possible solution, um, is to think more rigorously about ascertaining what it is that, that folks in the community want. How? Well, one would just be to conduct community surveys on a more... Um, quote, scientific basis than we have in the past, right? Rather than just round up the usual um, suspects that, let's say, community leaders or the, the police chief um, knows in the community, we know, how to do, we know how to do community surveys. I've done these, right? A lot of people have done them. You could imagine, um, and this goes to the fine-tuning aspect that you were talking about earlier, right, that you, you present the community with various options and find out exactly what they want. Not that it's determinative, but at least we would get some systematic information rather than just um, you know, making up what we think people want, um, number one. So that could be, you know, that should be funded. And, and we have funds to do that. We, we waste a lot of money on other aspects of criminal justice system. Um, you could construct ongoing community surveys that have a feedback mechanism into decision-making. Number two, 
I think, I, I mean, I have a little bit more faith perhaps in, in the community. Yes, these algorithms are, yeah, you can't just put up a, an ML algorithm and say, what do you think? But you could say, what if there was a 25% chance that crime would be reduced in your community? Because that's what the algorithms tell us or predict. But that means there will be more patrols, there will be more stop and frisk, or whatever the particular policy that's being considered. The thinking here has to do with trade-offs. And we don't put it that way, I think, to residents. Um, and I think that they're more sophisticated yeah. than we think. And they can, and you've thought about this too in your prior work in Chicago, thinking about high crime communities. And the great case, which I teach with, where the ACLU was defending, um, you know, not letting the police, let's say, go into a high crime rate project where the residents wanted it um, because there was a lot of shootings in that community. I'm not defending any particular policy, but the point is there are, not, there are conflicts in terms of what people want or institutions want. And we have to think in terms of a, a kind of a ledger of here's the pros, here's the cons, and get more feedback on what's acceptable. Now, that doesn't mean that if the community said, yeah, you know, <laughs> we're gonna be vigilantes and beat the shit out of um, people that come into the community. Obviously, that's a long-standing problem of unfettered social control within communities. That said, properly done, getting a more sort of social scientific evidence on standards and beliefs in the community, in particular communities that are impacted. Feeding that back into the system, but also getting a better sense of the pros and cons. Because let's face it, I mean, there are social values and norms of justice that we have to take into consideration. And it may well be that even if crime was going to be reduced and the prediction was accurate, that the costs on other dimensions of society that go beyond crime may negate implementing that policy from the perspective of, of social um, justice or the perspective of the community. I think those are the kinds of conversations that we need to have in ours. Can I have a really quick Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And I, I just want to make sure I think we're on the same page with this, Rob, because since we talked about it at your class that I jumped in, uh, that I guess lectured on last week. Fabulous. I, I think this is, we're, we're talking about the same thing. When we talk about the project, of surveying communities about what they want. Um, I think the clearest thing we can ask folks of it is questions about what is it that you believe you need to feel safe, right? Which is a different project from saying, how should some government agent respond, right? Separating out those two projects is really important because of course people should be very good at articulating their needs of safety. So if you live um, in, in Flint, Michigan, in the middle of COVID, you can say, well, I need clean water because I need to wash my hands multiple times a day, which is a different question from saying, what's the entity that should make sure that you have the clean water and how exactly should they be involved in, um, in responding to that project? And that, I, you know, what I take, I take it that you're saying, let's be really clear about how the, the impacted communities and uh, articulate their goals and then feed it into, you know, these instruments. And then just to be clear, yes, and, 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 how the state is going to respond and whether right. that response. But, yes, because part of that, whatever else. part of that survey or whatever input would be, there's multiple mechanisms that you might right. engage to deal with those problems. And that should be part of it right. too. Yes, that, that was sort of an underlying assumption. I'm glad you made it clear. And I think, I mean, that goes back to our starting point, which is, the point is not to ask the community or the machine to build a risk assessment system. I think that you're not going to ask them, how do we build a risk assessment system? Can you give us inputs into what algorithm should we use? You're asking them, what, what goal are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same thing you want to ask the people developing that system or tell them those, that goal. And so the community can be extremely useful in defining the requirements. What should it do? How should it be evaluated? And then let the algorithm produce candidates to be evaluated. Uh, 
I think one thing we're going to struggle with a little bit, which, you know, when this type of work happens, the community isn't sort of, we're not good at kind of educating the community in some of these things before throwing words and concepts at them. And so how do we develop that capability of going out in the community and, 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 and educating them on some of these concepts so that they're not coming in, you know, totally unprepared for having whether you go through it through you know, surveys or focus groups or, or you know, town halls, right now they kind of happen in, in a very haphazard way. So, so absolutely, I think, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a need for kind of defining the metrics. Or, you know, yes, you can reduce crime by putting everyone in jail. <laughs> um, and that does happen. I mean, there are several projects that have happened in, in predictive policing where the metrics were, at least one of them, the metrics were, we reduced crime and only arrested X number of, incre X number of incremental arrests. And if you talk to the community, he would have told you, well, there are other metrics in place as well. And, and that was not done, not because it didn't, that, that it wasn't measurable, but it was just never, that never came up in the process of requirements gathering. For these well, let, me, let me add something to what um, Reed said, and then I'll turn to the last question for the panel, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A, which is, I, I think that there's a, mm -hmm. I just want to surface that there are two sorts of feedback that you could have from the community, and one is, guidance for things like objectives or whatever. The second is more basic, which is how does the, basically community sentiment. You know, you buy something from Amazon and there's a, a question about community what? Sentiment. sentiment. Sentiment, sorry, it's my New Jersey accent. It's getting <laughs> in the way. Um, so community sentiment, and that actually does have a, a difficult kind of R&D challenge at the heart of it in the following sense, which is, as far as I know, I'm happy to be corrected if other people know, know differently, but as far as I know, the world's leader at, at collecting data on community sentiment is the Metropolitan Police Department in London. Maybe there are better departments that I, I don't know of any better ones. And they spend a lot of money, relatively speaking, doing detailed surveys of the sort that the panel has talked about. Um, you might wish it was more representative at smaller geographies or the questions would be different or whatever, but relative to what other police departments, they're, what they're doing is 10 standard deviations different and I think everyone would agree better. But because the in-person surveys are sufficiently expensive, they do it quarterly. Now, you know, if you think about things like predictive policing tools, you're having weekly ComStat meetings to decide what the police should do, where they should do it, how they should do it, whatever. I think if we as a field want public sector agencies like police departments to be able to act on this idea that community sentiment should be a measure, we <clears throat> need to help the agencies figure out a way to generate much higher frequency measures of community sentiment so we can account. And I think it, some of it's on the government agencies to, to do that, but. I think they're going to need some help as well figuring out mm -hmm. how, to, how to do that. Okay, let me turn to the last question for the panel then, which is, so as we started the conversation, um, as everyone in the room is aware, there is just a growing set of news accounts of AI failures, not just in the criminal justice system, but in all sorts of policy relevant domains, where algorithms are, among other things, exacerbating or generating unfairness. Let me say it that way. Um, and in the criminal justice space, those examples are set against a backdrop of a criminal justice system that incarcerates, as everyone here knows, uh, very disproportionately incarcerates low income, people from low income communities and communities of color. And that criminal justice system over the last 50 years has not been built by algorithms for the most part, but built by human beings. So with now- With algorithms we, in their head. With algorithms in their head, thank you. And so now here we are in 2021, and we have few alternatives in front of us, human beings and risk assessment. And so the question that I wanted to turn to the, uh, or open up to the panel is, how do we think about the role that risk assessment and data and algorithms, how do they, what role do they play as we think about how to reduce bias in the criminal justice system moving forward? Is, are these new tools, going to make this problem even worse? Do these new tools provide opportunities to reduce disparities? How should we, how should we think about it? Raid, everyone, <laughs> congratulations. Thank everyone you. Yes. At you. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. I mean, I, th I think I would start with the, the algorithms called humans. Right? Um, and our starting point, I mean, so, so I think in, at least the starting thought I have is humans are horribly biased. Right? We, we know that. We've seen the world as it is today. It's, it's wonderfully perfect, exactly as we want it to be. Um, and, but one benefit of, of, of the human algorithms is that they're not totally correlated. There's, a, there's variance in there. Yes, you know, people might be biased the same way, but, but the, 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 the you know, thousands and thousands of, of hundreds, thousands of police officers and each judge and each you know, prosecutor and like all the people in the whole system, they create sort of, they, re they reduce the risk of something going too horribly wrong. It's still going wrong. But, but, and so the, the risk with the, the three risk assessment systems making every decision in the country has both the potential to make things better because you can sort of say, here's the right way of doing it if we can ever figure it out. But it also it increases the risk that if those three are wrong and they're bad, the world will be much, 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 much worse, right? So I think that's kind of one dimension of we reduce the variance in, in, in the, the outcomes, but we, we, we also have the risk of making them go in all the same direction because there are not going to be a million risk assessment systems. There will be one or two or a handful mm -hmm. of them. I think the second dimension is to kind of think about to, to what Jens was saying was like, where, why are the outputs of these systems leading to biased outcomes? Um, and we would start with, well, the first reason is because they are, they are getting input from the world that is horribly biased. So often we sort of go to, well, the data is biased and if the data is bad, you know, the bad data in, bad algorithms out, all the different things. Well, no, the if the data was perfectly accurate, it exactly captured what happened in the world. Um, and most of criminal justice administrative data is reasonably accurate. It's biased, the world is biased in all the arrest records, but it's accurate data capture in, in most mm -hmm. cases. And so you can't blame it on bad data. You have to blame it on bad humans generating data that is accurate. But, but, but then when AI designers or you know, uh, developers use that data to make different decisions in the, in the system, they introduce bias through the data they choose to use. What is the outcome that they're going to use in the risk assessment tool? Is it an arrest? Is it an act of say, booking afterwards? Is it the sentencing? Is it like, what, 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 what outcome are you looking at? Uh, and we often pick kind of the easiest, whatever is there available to, to use. Uh, and a lot of other things we do. So, so that's, that in, you know, at a minimum, if we didn't make any of those mistakes, it would encode the bias from the world, but then because it would really focus on it, it would amplify it. But now we add all these other things, so the bias gets, keeps getting worse. And then at the end, again, going back to what are these systems going to be used for, the way you use them can amplify or reduce that bias, right? So if you, actually this was from work we were doing in Chicago, nothing to do with criminal justice, it was around childhood lead poisoning. We built the system to predict which kids are going to get lead poisoning. And in the first system that they were going to start to, when that we would predict that this kid is at risk of lead poisoning, the first thing the health department would do is make phone calls to the parents to get an appointment to go and do home inspections for lead hazards. And it turned out that they started doing those phone calls in English. The system we had developed, the technical system, was totally you know, fair. All the different things we can talk about. But then this, this, this action that was taken uh, was horribly biased. So it resulted in the whole system and the outcomes being biased. So the technical machine learning system being unbiased has nothing to do with the outcomes being unbiased. And the, and the intervention and, every, and you, know, you take being biased has nothing to do with the technical system. In some ways, you have to kind of look at the whole thing. Um, the, the, the machine learning being biased or unbi being unbiased is neither necessary or nor sufficient. Uh, and so I think we often kind of, when we think of bias, we look at sort of like, is the system biased? Is the, is, the, is the machine learning system biased? Is the data biased? As opposed to, it's a series of things that are all going in and eventually it's affecting these people. Are these people being affected in disparate ways? And if they are, we kind of need to touch. Um, and, and there are lots of different approaches to, I think, you know, what we're getting to is, we again spend a lot of time on the, on the algorithm, but not how this algorithm interacts with the person right after to make different types of decisions. So if this risk assessment system is being used to 
proactively provide people with social services or mental health services, like we've been doing this RCT for the last two years in Kansas, where we're predicting you know, jail reincarceration risk and then giving this information to mental health uh, responders to provide mental health services, that interaction is very different than providing this risk assessment system to a police officer um, and how are they going to interact with it and what the outcomes are going to be. So I think, again, the definition of bias is not there's a generic bias. It's very much dependent on the context in which the system is going to be used, what interventions is going to support. If they are punitive interventions, then there's a different notion of, of bias. You, you don't want to have you know, false positives that are disparate. If it's a helpful intervention, social services, you don't want to miss people disproportionately. Mm -hmm. and, and those are, again, yes, they're complicated and nuanced, but as Tracy said, like, those are complicated questions and, and they deeply impact people. So there's a, I think we can get to a place where these combined systems improve over humans, but we have to kind of deliberately design them to do that as opposed to just build it and hope that they do that. Mm -hmm. right. Rob and Tracy, do you want to add anything? I can, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Just two things, because it's really hard to improve on um, Braid's really comprehensive and thoughtful answer. And that is to say, when you're doing the work that he describes that we ought to do, I think it's useful to be attentive to certain kinds of work from different disciplines. And I think two are notable and um, that come to mind right now. On my phone, which you can't see, I actually have a slide show that I gave to my faculty yesterday, which is out about the social science of intergroup relations. And there's one piece actually that I would recommend to everybody in the audience who's interested in this question. It's a piece by Jen Richardson and, um, and Sam Summers called Ford, a social psychology of race and race relations for the 21st century. It's 67 annual review of psychology 439 is published in 2016. And what they do is there's a schema on page three that talks about sort of the relationship between like, the world, <laughs> as you were saying, um, you know, different decisions that state actors might make, um, how those uh, decisions impact, you know, people who are deemed to be part of certain groups. I mean, the point I'm making, and you can see on, on the schema that these decisions, that the very actions that we're taking with these algorithms have the impact actually of constituting the category that we know of as race itself, right? And so when we're talking about, you know, reducing racial disparities and so on, we also have to be very attentive to the fact that these activities that we're involved in are themselves the activities that create the category because the category doesn't exist really outside of these actions that we're taking. So, so that's one, that's the social psychology piece. And then second, I mentioned earlier um, philosophy my colleague Lily Hu, um, who was just hired in, in Yale philosophy, has actually done some really interesting work on uh, a similar question: is like, what does it mean to be engaged in the the process of um, making statistical predictions about how race causes some other thing? She's got an interesting piece in the Boston Review, so it's pretty accessible. Um, and, and short, I recommend it to folks, that is kind of a meditation on this question, the meaning of what we're doing, right? And so if there's one thing I think um, you all could take away from all of the things that all of us have said is that one should just really be very contemplative <laughs> about the meaning of what we are doing, independent of or, um, you know, in relation to these outcomes uh, that we're producing and that helps you to think very seriously about what does it mean to say that the outcome itself is accurate at all. But you want to add anything, Rob, and then we'll go to audience Q&A. Um, sure. So great comments. Um, just a couple, I guess, concluding thoughts before we open it up. Um, one, just, you know, I'm a little skeptical about technical fixes, and I think we're, we're all in agreement on that. And just one comment on the point about updating, because um, Jens, I was, you know, your, your city of 8.7 million, 2003, I mean, but suppose we had it till 2015 or, or whatever. I remember as recently as whatever, 2017, <coughs> criminologists, some were saying, well, we can assume continuing crime decline. Well, you could have had it up till 2019. Whoa, the pandemic hits, or 
Crime is up 50% in Chicago in the last year. Massive change. So even if it was up recently, um, it wouldn't account for that. I don't think we can outrun social change, let me put it that way. It's a huge uh, problem. And so I don't think there can really be a technical fix to it. I think we have to recalibrate a bit to use the language of uh, machine learning, what these risk uh, tools can and should do. And this goes to some of the points about aligning and being humble about the goals and aligning it with our sort of normative goals. Um, I wanna say something else about um, prediction and, and this may sound a little odd, but because you know this is American society of criminology, but one thing, that criminologists have taught us is that crime is concentrated with many other social ills, right? Why are we just predicting crime? Right. I mean, it's, a, it's sort of an obsessive conversation, it seems to me, that's out there about the accuracy of predicting crime right? and arrests that we know are rife with um, problems. Why aren't we predicting, and we could, um, other things? I mean, your comment, Raid, about lead, I mean, lead toxicity, um, health, Dilapidated housing. I mean, we could go on and on about the concentration of crime with other social adversities. So the conversation needs to be broadened. And prediction tools don't necessarily have to be used only for you know, criminal justice response. They could be used to predict need and interventions that aren't necessarily forced uh, on populations, but nonetheless. And, and we can even think about the, the broader conversation about the burden of the criminal justice system and mass incarceration on certain communities. People are talking about reparations, but you know, in an interesting way, if, if we're not only focused on the future, we have good measures of harm that have accrued historically, to predict backwards as it were. Um, and those are important metrics as well that could be used for uh, providing a different kind of social intervention. Mm -hmm. So it's not prediction per se, it's in part what we're predicting and how we're using it. And I think that goes back to the, to the human yeah. um, Can I use problem Can in, I just in the definition, right? So, I mean, I, I think we're too obsessed with crime, not that it's unimportant, but it's embedded in, in a larger social context. Yeah. I mean, one thing I, I do wanna mention is, you know, because we're at a criminal justice conference, these tools are being used to predict all the things that you just mentioned, right? Like we work on identifying students who might need extra support to graduate high school or get to reading level or get to college or disease, you know, people who might be at risk of different types of diseases, whether it's, you know, chronic diseases. Um, we do that for unemployment outcomes for to see who's gonna be unemployed for long term, or do that for um, you know, different types of social service needs. I think the distinction I do want to make is those are, are kind of, again, risk. they have all the same issues. Those fields have exactly the same. Like I've had these conversations mm -hmm. in, in those conferences and, and, and the same issues um, because underlying, you know, we can predict the risk, but often that's not what we want. We want to know, if I give you this service, will your outcomes get better? Mm -hmm. like you're looking for that, you know, the causal <laughs> answer, which is if I provide you with the service that you, you know, Will it help you? And of the six different services I can provide you, which one is most likely to work for you? But we don't have data for that to build these types of machine learning yeah. models. We haven't done those experiments. And so what we often do is we kind of take a two-step approach where we first do this risk prediction thing, use that risk prediction to identify the people who are kind of high needs, provide them with those services and do trials, get the data from those trials back to then build machine learning systems that will predict the risk changing as you get services that, that you need based on the specific program. Right. Small amendment. Yes, but couldn't you say that in a world of small short, causal, amend, small right. short amendment and then we'll yeah, open causal the, uncertainty, the you can still present people with that information. Yes. There's it's uncertainty additional. about multiple interventions, about health, about this, about that. It's great. Exactly. It, it, and you have to choose. That's right. It, it <laughs> wouldn't be the criminology meetings without a food fight on a panel. Perfect. Thank you. I, 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 can, I think I can see with the spotlight here that we have a a microphone or maybe two here. So uh, I think we have about 10 minutes left. I'd love to open it up to the audience for, uh, for dialogue questions to the entire panel, to selected people on the panel. I know this is a topic that lots of people care about. Lots of people have given a lot of thought to. Or we can continue the food fight.
<laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> interruption. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how we successfully transition a community that has had a consensus-based instrument to a validated risk assessment instrument. I ask this because particularly in uh, my state, we had many communities that did have um, consensus-based risk assessment instruments uh, for making detention decisions for juveniles. Uh, essentially, the community sat down, practitioners in a room, they decided, you know, we want to see these items on our risk assessment instrument. These are the points we're going to assign to those items. And then later, the legislator, legislatures required that there be uh, a validated instrument used statewide. And we've had a lot of issues with transitioning people away. And they do care about the individual items. They do want to know how much each of those individual items are weighted. And a lot of concern comes up when items aren't on the instrument that they expect to see. Mm -hmm. Things like um, charge severity does not always predict well. Um, and that's not something that a practitioner or community wants to see. They want to see that, you know, robbery is on the instrument and that it's getting lots of points. Um, thank you. Who wants to take that? Raid, do you want to? Yeah, it sounds like a raid. We've been talking about this. No, it's, it's a... Uh, it, <laughs> or Yen, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think this... Uh, I've had exactly the same... I think any of us who've been involved in this have had exactly the same experience, which is that practitioners and the, the community, all the involved stakeholders have developed intuitions strongly held intuitions about what matters out in the world. And so part of it is that they have a set of perceptions about the way risk works that may or may not be accurate. And then as Tracy mentioned, and everyone on the panel mentioned, there are a bunch of values on top of that as well. And you know, I think the, the, the values part to me feels like it is easier to solve mm -hmm. than the risk perception in the sense that at the end of the day, I think a sense from the panel is at the end of the day, these are public sector tools that are designed to serve the public. And if the public has a strong preference for whatever, I think that you have to give that very serious weight in the design of the, of the tool. I think what is much harder is in a world in which the public has miscalibrated perceptions of what matters for risk because to even, you know, the public is like, I want five points for this thing or I'm going to go bananas. It's like, give them five points. But if people believe that whatever is strongly associated with risk, it brings us back to the challenge that Tracy mentioned before. People are deeply allergic to risk, to, to math in general. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what is second nature to all of us, you know, X is correlated with Y, X is not correlated with Y. Most people are very, very far from even beginning to engage in that conversation. And I think, so I, I think to the extent to which I have anything helpful to say, I think it's just maybe try and separate out the values piece from the risk perception piece and be as accommodating as you think you can be on the, on the value side. Can I give one more uh, tactic that I use is instead of worrying about the instrument, I apply that instrument to people and I sort of show them which people are are scored high from that instrument, which we, because we, when we, we can't understand some of the correlations that even, even if you can, can do complicated math, understanding all these different correlations in an aggression model, it, it's, I can't do it. I have no capability. I don't trust myself to look at regularization. And, and so uh, the easiest for me is, is you show them the people and, and if they kind of intuitively agree with those, like here are the higher risk, here are the middle risk. Do you agree that these should be higher than these? And, that's something you can show mm -hmm. to kind of Rob's point in the beginning of giving them scenarios and examples rather than the math. Um, I think we found that that helps people move and understand Great. some of these tools, mm -hmm. even as they're complicated, much better. Great, thanks. Uh, next question. Hey, everybody. Um, first, oh, sorry. Getting used to microphones again. Um, so great panel. Thank you so much for the comments. Uh, so my name is Dan O'Brien. I'm at Northeastern University, where I think actually most of the panelists know I, I run a center that sort of conceptually lives at the intersection of a lot of what you guys are talking about here, right? This community data and action sort of thing. And 
I apologize. I have two questions, um, and hopefully, and they're not even really related to each other, but I'd love to hear uh, thoughts on both of them. Um, one is on the community engagement side. Rob, I, I appreciate your idea about surveys and stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of them because if you get diverse responses back, it then falls to someone to decide how to weight those di diverse responses. Do you do it cleanly, like 30% people wanted this, 30% of people wanted this, 30% of people wanted this, we can do a simple kind of weighted algorithm. Do you do something that prioritizes some voices over others? Do you then go back to those, you know, usual suspect uh, stakeholders that we always go back to, to make that adjudication, right? How do you do that? Um, and, and I want to suggest, I don't know if you're all familiar, there's this kind of growing area of participatory modeling uh, where, um, you know, scholars uh, work with community organizations to bring, quote unquote, transparent models to the community and allow them to dynamically play with, right? What would happen if I did this? What would happen if I did that? And then seeing the sort of the results and also seeing what their neighbors say, right? And what they seem to like and the, the solutions they design. And I guess I wonder, I, I'll... I'll turn this into a question, right? What, what could that look like in the current mode and how does that integrate with the other things that you all were thinking about? Um, my other question has to do with administrative data, right? Machine learning is possible because we have big data, right? That's the only reason why it's possible. And unfortunately, the big data is what contains the bias, right? The administrative data is what's basically codifying our institutional biases into a spreadsheet. And then, you know, you put that into the system and you get garbage out you get the bias out as well. And I guess the question is, do any of you have, you know, innovative ideas or creative ideas of how we get around that? Because, you know, Rob, you wrote a lot in the 1980s and 90s about how victimization surveys are an important way to get away from the bias of administrative data. But that then cuts off the advantage of having big data because you got to do victimization surveys and those aren't going to be big. Um, and so, yeah, those are my two questions, right? How could participatory modeling help here? And do we have a way out of the biased administrative data trap that can make this feasible or, or is this just not gonna work? Okay. <laughs> I guess is my question. I think we are nearly at time. So whoever wants to give brief responses to, to both of those and then we'll turn it over to our organizer okay. and chair, Dan Nagin. Well, maybe really brief. Um, yeah, Dan, I think that's a really good point. Your first question. Um, I guess what I would say is Diversity of opinion in a community is important information, right? And and we need to know that. Right? In fact, there was a recent interesting article last year in Criminology on how heterogeneity and perceptions of collective efficacy is a predictor of crime. So, um, I think we don't know <laughs> so that much. And to the extent there is diversity of opinion, I'm not just talking about community surveys. It would then be fed back in interaction with the community. The participatory engagement sounds like a, a wonderful. Um, feedback mechanism to work with. So I think we need to try it. And then on the administrative data, I, I agree. Um, but I, that's why I don't think we should rely on it uh, maybe, totally. Maybe I'll just give one, a one sentence answer to that and then we'll turn it over to Dan, which is uh, there is a very, there's a well-known, there's a very well-known technical fix to that problem, which is very counterintuitive, which is to give the algorithm access to the protected characteristics so that it can learn and undo the bias in the data. The challenge is not technical. The challenge is our legal frameworks don't fit well with what the algorithms would need to be able to do to, un to undo the administrative data bias. And so the law and the regulations, I think, are catching up to the technology. On that note, let me turn it over to Dan. We first started thinking about this actually in a conversation with Rob and last spring and in which maybe because we're both pessimists, we were concerned this would turn into some boring uh, you know, kind of discussion of, uh, of technical issues. And, and it's been just the opposite of that. This has been uh, a, a, a better session than I could have you know, possibly even was hoping for. So I want to uh, thank all, all four panelists, Rob, Tracy, Jens, and Reed for uh, uh, just a wonderful discussion. And I think the fact that we could just probably keep going on for another hour and a half uh, shows how, uh, how well it went. So thank you. Good job. Great. Good job. Thank you very much.